Welcome to the Real Advisor Podcast, T-R-A-P, TRAP. Please follow us and join in the conversation on Twitter at Advisor Podcast, where you can suggest ideas and themes you'd like the TRAP team to discuss. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a six out of five star review on iTunes. Doing all this really, really helps us, which means we can do more to help you. Now let's head over to the studio for the latest pile of trap. Yes, indeed, dear trappists. Welcome back to what many people are calling episode 21 of the Real Advisor podcast, T-R-A-P Trap. My name is Nick Lincoln or Lick Lincoln. Joining me are two of the three other horsemen of the apocalypse, Andy Hart and Alan the Storyteller Smith. But we have a special guest host for this episode as our fourth horseman, Carl Widger. It's 1 a.m. In, in Los Angeles. Carl's on his knees somewhere in a, in a side alley off Sunset Boulevard looking for an Irish <laughs> pub or some, somewhere selling him a can of Heineken. We have Amelia Powell as our fourth guest host. Welcome, Amelia. Morning. Thanks. Thanks for letting me join you guys. No problem at all. Our pleasure. Amelia, just so the Trappists have a flavour of who you are, um, t- tell, tell the dear Trappist a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I entered the profession about three years ago. I work with my mum for Premier Wealth Solutions. Um, I'm still on my exam course path, so a bit with Alan here, going up the hierarchy, trying to catch my mum who did all the exam routes. Um, and during my journey, my husband is a sports professional and felt that there was an opportunity to offer advice to people that are in similar positions that we are. Um, and I launched the subsidiary band Premier Wealth Solutions Sports Professionals. Um, otherwise, in my spare time, I'm a mum to three kids, busy life, work hard. Great stuff. And, and you, you and your mother, you, you, you went to a very expensive recording studio. It's Amelia, Amelia on the show. She investigates, interrogates and soaks it up as she goes. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Our first guest host and our first guest host drop. Thank you to you and Jackie just, for, for just doing Just got to smash it, haven't you? Come in, yeah. make an impact. Yeah, smash it. That's one, that's one oh. way of describing it, definitely. Smash it. Excellent stuff. <laughs> I mean, Emilia, just, um, Emilia, Emilia hmm. you're 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 really really welcome on the uh, on the show. Great to have it as our first guest uh, guest co-host. It's worthwhile noting that as it's the twenty first episode, Nick, we are now hmm. officially in the top one percent of all podcasts ever in the history of the world. Because remember that Congrats. that's the thing that's the thing that um, Chris, your mate Chris, Andy talks about because ninety nine percent of all podcasts. Chris Williamson talks about this. 99% of all podcasts never get past 20 episodes. So we're officially in the top 1%. And you're here there as we well, go. Amelia, to, uh, to celebrate. So, yeah, welcome. Great stuff. Great stuff. So um, just, just one quick close question. Your husband, Amelia, was he a professional football player? Was he? He, he is actually still um, a professional footballer. <laughs> no, but the joke is he hasn't got a contract at the minute. So I suppose was is um, the right term to use. But no, yeah, he's still in sports. Okay. You call it kicky Grey, ball. Grey, but not yet 30, so. Pardon? Kicky ball, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't... I, I just, I mean, I, my, 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 my team, as such as I have one, is Watford, which is a, which is a, a joke for all the, all the wrong reasons. Um, okay, <laughs> let's, um, let's give this episode a topical timestamp with some topical tidbits. Um, and no, I'm no, 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 no. Reviews. Is, uh... Re- reviews first, Nick. Oh, reviews. I'm God, I'm sorry. Come I'm sorry. on. Mr. Absolute Hart. shambles. Absolute 21st shambles. episode. Oh, my God. Absolute shambles. Right, right to Mr. Me. Hart, sorry. Give us three more high-energy podcast reviews. Okay, the first review is from Phil723. The four horsemen are crushing it, five stars. Great insights, useful advice, interspersed with lots of banter and invaluable resource. Next up is a must-listen, where, wherever you are in your financial planning career. Some great insights and nuggets, a very easy listen. Nick Platt, a good friend of the show. And the final one is from Ray Prince, not too shabby, five stars. And here was me thinking that the old southern mucker, Mr. Lincoln, had hung up his mic. 
you can't keep him silent for too long, if at all. And here he is mixing up with three wise heads full of wisdom and advice, all aimed at helping financial advisors and planners get better at what they do, which in turn helps uh, with our clients. Episodes 11 and 12 are gold dust with Nick's If I Was Starting Again, niche marketing strategy spot on. Keep it up chaps and chap s's so over to you nick back to you great stuff thank you andy yeah and uh Rio, ray thank you for that very very very, very kind words okay so uh, this is the real straight into the weed stuff as well um but we are, we're all aware that about seven eight years ago uh final salary transfers were for whatever reason technical reason just very high relative to what they've been before and that led to a, some good practice but also a lot of bad practice in other words people transferring out of these schemes so you might still get clients who, who've got these, 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 these final salary schemes from years ago and they've, they've asked for a transfer value and they might come to you and say, well, you know, this, this looks on paper like a really big amount of money. It might be the biggest asset they own outside of their, their property, say. There's a, there's a decent website, and I'll put a link to it in the so-called show notes, the XPS Transfer Value Tracker, which tracks transfer values of a typical DB member over the years. And it's just graphic, and you can just show to clients, yeah, you might think that figure of whatever it is, 200, 300 grand is a lot of money, but actually transfer values have fallen off a cliff over the last couple of years, again, for a variety of technical reasons that clients don't really need to know. They just need to know you've told them that the transfer values have gone down. Um, and it's quite just a useful resource to show people, you know, just if you, if you think your transfer value is high, they really have plummeted and it's an ongoing graph. So it's updated all the time. Uh, basically, transfer values, have, according to this graph, have gone from the typical transfer value has gone from two hundred and seventy thousand pounds to one hundred and sixty-eight thousand pounds. Wow! Wow! Uh, yeah, yeah big, um, and that's big fall. But, that's, yeah, that's interest basically. rates and guilt yields, isn't it? Predominantly. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's collapsing guilt prices and rising guilt yields. Have a, it's this, it's this, it's all linked to this stupid, to this stupid. I mean, actuaries really, they are, they should be rounded up. This idea that you had to match future liabilities by going into guilt. On, on db schemes which really made D, db schemes unaffordable in the early noughties uh in, in insanity on stilts but there we are um okay mr smith uh life after me life after me.com um mutual friend of ours helen harcroft um an advisor in london I mentioned this last week quite interesting actually life after me.com is a digital platform where you can store assets. So you, in theory, this is kind of, you know, in order to, to you know, have a central place to store important documents such that if you're no longer around when people pass away, um, obviously you can you could scan in, um, you know, wills and trust documents and various other things. But increasingly, we've all got more and more digital assets. And not, I mean, not, not just kind of... Um, yeah, digital books, digital music, but things like emails. If somebody passes away, your family have no longer got access to any emails, any past information that's held on a digital platform. And if you tell your email provider that the person has died, then they'll immediately close it down. So this is a methodology of storing this information. I've had a look at it. I haven't, I haven't gone any further than just looking at the website, but it does say it's all encrypted data, GDPR approved and so on. But I just thought it was quite interesting as... As we all get older, as clients get older, just have some a, you know a useful place to store vital data, such that the family isn't in a complete mess after somebody passes away. So worth having a look. I, th I think these services. Yeah, become... I I did look at this. Go on, Nick. Go on. Go on, Nick. <laughs> Come on, Andy. Go. I I think these services will become uh, more and more prevalent um, and a lot more, um, yeah, at the moment, there's not really much around this space, but I believe more and more companies will be getting into this space. Um, yeah, you're right. It's just uh, how easy is it going to be to upload all the information? Then you're going to share the passwords with you know people that you trust and when you pop it, then they're going to log in and yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. It's a mess, isn't it? Your, your digital f footprint post death is, is a complete mess. Um, you know, Google, yep. Dropbox, two-step authentication, all the passwords, bank accounts. Yeah, it's uh, it's messy uh, at best. Over to you, Nick. Yes, I looked at Helen's link when she sent it through to us, to to, to the group that we were in, the, the peer group. And uh, are these, there are quite a few of these now, aren't there? That's the, that's the only thing. And they're thinking, okay, which ones are going to survive um, in terms of being 
profitable and so forth. But having a, I mean, I saw my parents, you know, my parents are alive and I saw them in Spain a few weeks ago. And my dad has written out all the stuff, you know, he's very pragmatic. My dad, he's called it, he's called it like the book of death. Um, you know, um, <laughs> this is where everything is, but it's all handwritten. Very, very, and, uh, you know, that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I would say that my generation, this would be, I would love something like this. Um, but other clients that we work with, or maybe people that aren't as IT literate, this might be a bit overwhelming. I know when I've sent out and trying to make things go more IT um, in terms of cash flow or the, like docu signs and stuff, some people just aren't interested. So it might be a slow burner as it sort of moves into later, more IT literate people without offending anyone there, but yeah. No, 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 so that's a point well made. And I'm guessing with your client bank, as it grows, Amelia, it's gonna be younger people because you've got, you're working with sports people, right? So hopefully that, that, that tech resistance point isn't too acute for your, for, for your, for your client bank. Um, no, not at yeah. all. And I would say with generational wealth as well, it's much easier. Everything I do is digital. I don't do anything. Um, it was probably an area that I was going to bring to you guys. What will the next generation of financial planning look like for, I think it's Jed Zen, Jed X, millennials. Um, just from a personal experience, when I recently built a house, I employ professionals through Instagram. That was where I went to there oh. and look at people. Wow. I didn't, wow. you know, I'd, I'd go off word of mouth if there was an architect or a QS or somebody like that, I would go, or a lawyer, for example, I would go off personal recommendations, but generally where there was a void, how I would vet somebody now is a social media profile. That's what, yeah, that's like where a, I would go. Bathroom fitter, flooring, all that sort of stuff. It's so visual. Yeah. Yeah. On, on I'd go media. to see and then, yeah, they would demonstrate their work. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Wow. Well, just you're, interesting. you're adding value already, Amelia. Great to have <laughs> Alan, <you. laughs> Alan yeah. have you, um, have you, Carl have who? you Carl who? as an example, have you digitized your, your future life <laughs> or when you're not here? Have, have, have I? No. Yeah. No, not at this stage. And I, and I should do, I should, I should get around it. I mean, we've, um, I've certainly come across client situations where they have passed away and we've got a few documents, but we certainly don't have, have all of them as, as their advisor. And it's an absolute mess. It's an absolute mess. You've got children, grandchildren sometimes. Saying, absolute do you, shambles. Do you know, do you know where, do you know where dad's, you know, this document and that document? And I say, no, unfortunately not. And we've tried to be more kind of engaged with clients. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's tricky, and yeah, I think this this is a generational thing. You're not going to get certain people, certain clients, just immediately to digitize all their documents, scan them, upload them, and then everyone's. And as I say, I just think that the biggest thing is. Remember a few years ago, Bruce Willis had a big argument with Apple about all the music that he's bought on iTunes, and they said it's not yours, even though he's paid for it because he wanted his daughters. He, I mean, he had like tens of thousands of songs. It might be different now with Spotify and streaming. I don't know. But he reckons Bruce he Willis. bought them. They said legally be, you're only renting Bruce them. Bruce Willis, Alan. Yeah. Bruce Willis. Why? Well, it was. Bruce Willis. Correct. Okay. He had a big <laughs> legal legal battle with Apple. It was just, And the whole thing was just about dig, ownership of digital assets after, after you're dead. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an issue. It's worthy, worthy of further exploration and debate. This is just a new tool that exists. It's not the only one out there, but it's, um, it's a, probably a useful discussion point for some of your clients thinking about planning for, you know, life after. All right. Yeah. Alan's, Alan's point, Andy, is not the, not the recording artist having a beef. It's the, the Joe Public who buy music. But Bruce Willis, renting, Bruce Willis just bought, he just bought, the, he spent tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars or music on iTunes back in the day. And he just said, well, I want my, t my daughter, I want my children to own this. And they said, no, it doesn't pass across. <laughs> I don't know how that eventually got resolved. But anyway, it is, it's an increasing thing as more and more of our life and assets are digitized. And, you know, we, we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of, of, of kind of crypto and NFTs. These are all digital assets. And, you know, the transfer of ownership of those down the line, it's a mess. Yeah. Good Move luck on. with that. 
Okay, uh, next thing on the topical tidbits, uh, Mr. Hart, Quilters have uh, announced some changes to their platform charger. Yeah, I mean, I don't predominantly use Quilter, but I've got a couple of legacy clients on there for various reasons. Uh, they sent me an email the other day about their platform charges being reduced, and I thought they were quite substantial reductions. Um, so I just thought I'd uh, I'd raise it here. Do we think that that's going to be a thing, platform charges going down? I know Transact have been very proactive in this space ever since they've launched they launched you know purposefully profitable and then they said as we scale we'll reduce the fees and they've done that um and yeah i just thought it was interesting to see that quilters substantially reduce their fees certainly on the on the lower end clients that they're looking after um yeah on the high end it seems to be the same sort of fees so yeah platform fees really and uh, being reduced uh, any points on that I'll, I'll just leap in there and say that the quilters have brought their platform fees down to Hargreaves Lansdowne levels. They're still they might, they're still expensive. By uh, any, I'll, by, by I'll just a couple of points. When you've got a product or a service which is largely commoditized, which platforms are really, there's nothing, there's none that I don't see that stand out as saying, I don't mind paying a bit extra because this is so good. Uh, then if in any commoditized product or service, it's a race to the bottom on costs. And, and they're obviously coming up against some competitive pressure. Maybe others have reduced their fees and costs, so they're just trying to keep up with the market. There's more and more assets being placed on platforms. There's still, I don't know what the numbers are, but billions and billions in legacy products that are still being moved across bit by bit from, you know, old Phoenix Life plans, et cetera. Probably so there's, there's still a lot... Hundreds of billions. Yeah, hundreds of billions. Old. So there's still a land grab. There's still a lot of business to get after. And increasingly, you know, your advisors are looking at costs and they're saying, well, you're more expensive than somebody else. So it's just, I think that's, there's, there ultimately comes a point at which they can't reduce it any further. Uh, you need to have a profit margin. You need to be reinvesting and improving your tech over time. So they're, they're, I think they're getting quite close. Quite close I mean, to that. Unless you go down another another route, which is you, you see in the US, you, f you see firms oh, yeah. like Schwab and I think Fidelity, where it's free. You know, custody Basically, and trading is yeah. free because they're selling you something else, and they're making they're making a turn on the cash, the cash holding, and yep. you could get towards that. But just just one thing related to this, I noticed in the it's only the only kind of newspaper I read is the FT at the weekend, and there was a report in the FT at the weekend about this that, and they, they were mainly focusing on DIY investors, and obviously the. The uh, the big daddy in that game is Hargreaves Lansdowne, and they are considered to be more expensive nowadays. And so there was a, I just thought it was quite intriguing that the, the report reflected, they said a lot of DIY investors are moving off Hargreaves Lansdowne because it's quite expensive. And they highlighted a firm called NetWealth, which I'd heard of before, kind of positioned themselves. I think it's an, the founders an ex Goldman Sachs lady who just felt that they could do a, a better DIY offering. You underestimate the power of the dark side. And they are coming in with platform and funds at about 1%, which I don't think is particularly cheap for, for no advice. You know, bundled everything together, just you know, give you a fund and a platform. And that's pretty much it as far as I can see. 1%, I think we can, in certain circumstances, we can offer that ourselves with full advice, full financial planning advice yeah. for around 1% for certain clients. So, yeah, just quite interesting how this stuff is being reported in the national press. There we go. Amelia, do you, does, does, does your firm and, and your mother's firm, do you have a preferred platform? Do you know what? I was actually going to ask the same of you guys then, just listening. Um, we tend to inherit a lot of legacy clients. And um, so we take on, and I was going to ask, how do you manage that? You talked about transact. That's come up to me before to do some reading around, but is there a one-stop shop where you, there's a comparable of, <clears throat> of platforms and different fees and what do you guys use for that? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leap in. I, I use a service called Advisor Asset, which is quite well known in, in, in the IFA community. You pay a monthly subscription and you can put into there your client profile. So maybe a husband and wife, you know, they've got ISAs and pensions on a platform and you put the amount in um, or, and then you just run it through advisor asset and it'll just list all the platforms by reduction in yield, basically, which is the first point just to look at charges, but you can put in things like flexibility. So does this platform allow 
various decumulation strategies? Does it charge for rebalancing? An advisor asset will filter. Basically, you, you, you start off with the answer you want and you like all these things, you, you fiddle with it to give you to give you the answer at once, but it's very good. And uh, it's about, I can't remember what I pay for it. It's a, it's a monthly sub, but I'd start with that one. But I think things like the Langcat, um, they have a they have the platform analyzer tool, which is very similar, Amelia, so you can kind of strip out. I think um, the problem but, that, that I find is the more clients you have with different providers, there's a different level of service wherever you go. And that makes, I know something we're going to talk about later, but that makes any sort of report writing for that client particularly difficult when they've got lots of different legacy products with lots of different providers who all offer a different level of service on their platforms. That's a frustration for me. So I know that you enjoy the simplification of planning, Nick. I know you spoke about that before. Um, and in terms of efficiency of the business, I'm fully on board with that, but that's not how it plays out. Um, yeah, I just, I think you've got to have a platform strategy that applies to your business. Interesting, Nick, that you, that advisor assisting, as you've described, I remember looking at that a few years ago, it's, it's almost back to the, the dark days of what used to be AQOS and Synaptics, whereby you looked at on a client by client basis. And, and, you know, theoretically, you can end up with 10 different platforms across your client base, which is not the way I see things. I, I see I see platforms as, as what, what do you call it, Andy? Plumbing, just plumbing, plumbing in your business. Yeah, plumbing. And, it's, and we, we, we've got a fairly homogenous client bank. We don't deal with, you know, people with tens or hundreds of millions and, and people with, you know, threepence halfpenny. We've got a gen, generic kind of client profile that, you know, one or two platforms, you know, fit the bill for most of those circumstances. Of course, you get the occasional situation, you have to go a bit off piece, but we just believe in understanding that. So we do, and we subscribe, historically, we've subscribed to the Landcat, and that gives us enough ammunition to say, yes, by and large, for most of our clients, this one or two platforms is likely to be the best. And it's very, de- relating back to what we just said, I think it's very dangerous to look at the lowest, look at cost as a key driver. Because really, there's not much difference between one and the other. I think service experience is what it's all about. Can I can I just clarify? I didn't. I, so I do platform due diligence once a year, and once right. a year I, I I feed in my typical client profile, t- you know, typical client age in their fifties, typical pension pot, typical, and just put it in just just for the number crunching. I don't do that on a case by case basis. Where I think where tools like Advisor Asset are good, they're for things like pension switching. They have sort of ancillary tools as well. But right. even that now, I think as long as I've got the charges for the seeding scheme. I don't, you know, do we need to know what the projections are at age 65, you know, at five, seven and nine percent and all that rubbish and compare? I don't I don't know. Hopefully we've moved on a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Okie dokie. Now, Amelia, the CII, I hope I got this right. The CII 150th birth. Will they get to 151? Yeah, there's a lot of strife with the CII, isn't there? And why do you talk about that, um, Amelia? Also, I know I know you do some work for the, with the PFS. So could, would you mind just expanding on that first, and then quickly talk, and then then go on to the, the CII 150th birthday? Yeah, of course. So the relationship really was intertwined. I um, am an active member on the PFS for the Northwest region. Um, I was kind of chucked in by my mum, to be honest. But she <laughs> said, she said this will be really good. Um, we we get involved with a lot of the quarterly meets. We do them locally to us. And I was born into the new professionals um, role alongside Craig, who's actually left now, Craig Stokes. Um, and a part of my role is to help new entrants. It's not necessarily young. It's anybody that's entering the profession. Um, find a place at the table, connect with other professionals, understand what events we offer, understand what the PFS can do to help, um, and understand that we are, they are a separate body to the CII, complementary in a lot of ways, but that they can offer other services. So we went to um, the CII representing the PFS, just to look at how the relationship can help each other. Um, they, the CII do a lot, they do a lot of events. The 150th birthday was, incredibly well organized it had taken a lot of organization um we went to one of the chair meetings on the run-up for that so i I understand the work that went in and they had quite a lot of guest uh, speakers there was a a fantastic poet i can't remember his name but 
I will give you that for the show notes. I think I've got a copy, copy of the poem he wrote. He was a proper mank. He was great. Um, <laughs> he was really, really Northern, um, but beautifully written for the CII. So it was very special. Um, and then we had a few different, there was a round table. There was lots of different insurance institutes, um, some that were relevant to our profession as well. And Piers Linney was one of the speakers there. Um, he gave a great off the cuff, this has been my life. This is where I think Insurance Institute need to keep up. He talked about AI and the advancement in technology. Um, and he was kind of one of the examples he gave. And if I don't relay this, Piers, sorry, um, as well as you did. But he said, car insurance, where will that be in 10, 20 years time? Well, who's going to be driving cars? So yeah. why are you going to need car insurance? Um, and he just emphasized that this is going to be fast. You need to keep up. If you're left behind, you are going to be left in the dust kind of thing. So he was great. He's so inspiring as a person. He's done incredibly well, ex Dragon's Den. Um, so yeah, I, I, I try and get involved with both professional bodies as much as I can. Um, I don't know if you guys have any younger new members to your team. I think you've got Olivia Allen. Did you post about Olivia? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so would you guys be chucking your younger members of the team towards the PFS, towards the CII to get involved with these kind of professional bodies? And if not, why? Short answer for me is, is yes. Yes, we would. Um, historically, we've always been members and subscribed to these professional bodies. We were, we were kind of running a, in the old days and sort of before your time, I suppose, Amelia, there was the Institute of Financial Planning, the IFP, and it was such a great learning ground. I mean, look, look, I think, I think all of us on, on this call participated in that, um, run by a, a, an amazing guy called Nick Can, who sadly had a stroke some years ago, but there was a period of time. It was just a place to be. And I, I learned so much about this concept of real financial planning. <laughs> Grab yourself a drink, a very long drink. It's story time with Alan Smith. No story, really. It was just, I, I, think, I think all of us did. They were, they used to, the IFP conference down in uh, Celtic Manor in Wales was a sort of annual pilgrimage that we went to. And there was just a, it was a kind of foundation of a group of inspiring people. And, um, you know, People like me have now sort of come through and, and are the more mature veterans. But in those days, I was a sort of young guy trying, trying to learn things. So we really embraced that. And we learned about this concept of real financial planning and building cash flow models and all that sort of stuff. And the PFS were always in the CI are much more kind of technically driven, as, as I saw it. You know, you had to get, that's where you got your exams. The IFP was part of the, what do you call it? The body that did, the, well, they, they signed off the CFP license, which obviously is, is a global certificate in financial planning. And the PFS sort of won, the, won the, the game because they went off to the, I think it's called the Privy Council, and they captured this qualification called the Chartered Financial Planner from under the nose of the IFP. Anyway, it was kind of, if you ever, if you ever watched Monty Python. It's, yeah, it was people's front of Judea stuff. People's front of Judea and the Judea's people front. Um, it was a bit like that. And then ultimately, we as a business had to choose one, one horse to ride, I suppose, because we ended up being dual members of both. We had to do our annual, you know, our CPD and this certificate and stuff for both of them. Eventually, we said, you know what? And the IFP kind of got consumed by CISI. And at the time, that to me just seemed like a much more kind of technical. They were all about bloody, you know, complicated options tradings or something like that. that was a lot of the, the stuff I'd read. I know they've improved a lot since then and much more embracing the financial planning. So we've gone down the CII PFS route. All our team, the appropriate members of our team are members of it. But it's a useful reminder, actually, Amelia, because we probably don't go to as many events as perhaps we should do. And it's probably a great place to meet nowadays, meet in person. Younger members of the profession, younger members of my team would probably benefit a lot from just getting together with like-minded people like yourself, and just sharing thoughts and ideas. So, yeah, we'll, we'll Yeah, and it's, we'll, we'll I suppose it's develop, like developing those because I, I know from honesty, people see them as a CPD exercise. They yeah. go, they get their hours, they walk away. And it's making sure you can take some of this full fat financial planning. You can take some of the downtime, some of the networking, some of like the collaborative working where you sit. And that is what I am pushing for. I find them 
relatively stiff at the moment. We go, we sit there, we listen to the talks and we're losing that interpersonal bit, which is the value where the likes of me that are newer to the industry interrogate the likes of you yeah. and sit and ask you all the questions that I want to. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely trying to help and support that. It, it's that age old thing, isn't it? With, the, with, with conferences, Amelia, that the, the conferences are generally okay. Some are better than Andy's, you know, is, 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 is one of the better ones, if not the best one. Uh, but it's the stuff in between. It's the breakout sessions is when you have a, a, a cup of coffee or something, you know, and then you talk, you go and seek out someone in the room who you kind of admire from a distance and just, just get a chance to pick his or her brains. That's, that's for the actual sitting yeah, totally. down in the auditorium part is, can be quite, quite tedious. I guess, you, I guess also you, you're involved, would you be involved with next gen? Um, that would seem oh. to be the, go on. <laughs> I love next gen. That's where my journey started. That's where I am pushing Nick through as well. He's doing his exams. Um, not quite aggressively as I attacked my exams, but he's doing exams. Um, but yeah, no, my whole journey started with next gen, actually another incredible financial planning firm, clear cut Jane Gao. She runs, um, mm. a financial planning business with her daughters. When we originally started off, she gave us quite a bit of advice and Adam Owen had come in and given some training and that was a career. That's how they did their career progression and got their diploma. So I contacted Adam and. I mean, I couldn't, I could not fault them. They have grown the business from strength to strength, their offerings there. I was just watching the other day, um, Dan, I think it's Graham, his last name, had done a few YouTube clips of social media and yeah, all of he does these. The, he does the podcast, doesn't he? He interviews people. Yeah, he's just, yeah, yeah. yeah, and he's so, he's so cool. You know, he knows so many technical advances and all these apps and, um, there's just such a wide offering now for so many people that, so I am also going to their, um, I think it's conference, their awards ceremony. Are you guys going to go? Yeah, I'm there. It's uh, <laughs> Good two, question. two weeks time. Two weeks time. That's next week, yes. isn't it? Yes, now, it is. Yeah, I'm in Manchester 60, for three days. 10 days. Um, yes, it's next. So uh, apparently there's a, an award for um, best podcast. The we've been know, you guys for. Have, yes, congratulations. Yeah, don't Amelia, forget to Amelia. don't forget to vote for us. You're a, you're a big influencer within Next Gen. I want you to get influencing. All right, you've, yeah. you've already boosted Next. <laughs> any Next Gen listeners, it's the best place ever, and vote for us. Okay. Yeah, we love it's, Next Gen. It's Friday the sixteenth no, of June. You, you, they the are. conference. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Good. I actually Very got good. shortlisted for an award too. So, kudos, guys. Oh, we're brilliant! Here. Wow, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so you met so you met Piers Linney, and you were amazed by his 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 talk at this um the CII birthday. Uh, following on from that, and this sort of AI theme, which Mister Magpie can't get rid of at the moment, it's it's stuck in his beak and it just won't be pulled out. <laughs> Mister Smith, you had an AI workshop that I believe uh, was um, interesting. You don't throw this together, do you? This is all planned and organised. That's a beautiful segue. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I our, wish. My, uh, my, you just mentioned my very, my now close personal friend, X Dragon, <laughs> Mr. Piers Linney. Oh, the, the last episode that went out, last episode of Trap went out, it went out on the day of an AI workshop that I was involved in. And Piers Linney was involved in, and he was co hosting it together with a guy called Alok Shukla, who I've known for years. Turns out Andy Hart knows him as well, but there you go, small world. Look, the, I went, it, it is, of course, it's the current theme. It's the buzzword. Everyone's talking about it. But I think there's a reason that everyone's talking about it. It is, it is transformational. The, if, if you spend any time just having a look at the, what, what exists currently, what is likely to exist in the next, um, the next sort of few months, really, um, it, it's, it's very interesting and you can't really avoid it uh, if you want to be successful going forward. So it's, this is a tough – I mean, it's a big thing for someone like me to say. I mean, I've been in this – I've been over 30, 35 years in this business. I've attended countless conferences, workshop, workshops, you know, days, learning, learning opportunities. I would say – I may have recency bias, but I would say this was the most impactful day I've ever had. I just think it was just an absolute, you know, mind-blowing. I kept on sort of shaking my head and going, my God, my God, because the stuff they were showing and demonstrating – we don't have time to go into it right now, but 
It was absolutely fascinating. It was amazing. And as a consequence, there's a lot of buzz in the financial planning community about this because of all the professions. I think this is one we can really, the people who get behind this and embrace artificial intelligence <clears throat> can absolutely leap forward and take, take. There's so much. I mean, Amelia, you're learning this now. And we will talk about it. There's so much just grunge and gunk in our business. It's just old fashioned, just, you know, manipulating data and looking at boring spreadsheets, which the machines can do in a fraction of the time with a higher degree of accuracy than any human can, can do. So if it releases us from the, you know, the, the real, the sort of the grunt work and frees us to do the stuff that we all love doing and clients frankly prefer us and enjoy it more, which is the human side of it, then fantastic. Mm. Why not embrace it? So we are, there's a plan to put together another full day AI workshop specifically for financial planners. Um, so I will obviously, if anyone just follows me on LinkedIn or Twitter via, via this, um, this podcast, I'll be posting information about it. I'm, I'm, I've got a meeting later on this week to agree and discuss dates and opportunities. And so anyone who's interested to get in touch and get along to that day. Okay. Okay. And very, else to be very said? good. Uh, what's the final topical tip that we have? Mr. Smith. Yeah, yay, just yay. thought. On the subject of, you know, in-person, live and in-person events, my other podcast, my award-winning podcast, this is the soon-to-be award-winning podcast, Bullshit. but my other award-winning podcast, Bullshit. Bulletproof Entrepreneur, check it out. Um, we are doing a live and in-person event. First time I've ever done it, 26th of June, Central London, with... Um, another close personal friend of mine, Henry Dimbleby, who's the founder, obviously part of the Dimbleby um, Gang. broadcasting dynasty. Uh, and also the founder of Leon, the fast food chain, uh, who had an exit last year for a hundred million pounds. He and I are going to be having a sort of fireside chat conversation podcast episode live and in person, expecting over a hundred people to be there. So if you are interested and you're in London at the end of June, Check it out. You're very welcome to come along. That's Where's it, it. going to be, Alan? Is it a homegrown? Yep. Homegrown private members club for entrepreneurs. Nick and I are both members. <laughs> this is true. This is very true. Alan, do you, do you realize I've, I've kept a log over the last few months. You've actually got 3,648 close personal friends. <laughs> so, um, how, how, do you, how do you keep them all in front of mine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> just, that's just it. Right. Okay. I think I think we've given those topical tips. It's a damn good thrashing, and it's time to move on to the meat and potatoes of the show. Amelia, uh, you're valued as a guest for numerous reasons. One of which is that you bring um, a youthful perspective to to the uh, the show because we're old we're old lags and we've been at this game for a while. And you are going to have some questions addressed in the meat and potatoes, things that are front of mind for you as as you as you pursue your journey into this brilliant thing of ours this, this this grand profession of financial planning or full fat financial planning i like the way you use that phrase that's that's one to cling on to so three points that you raise global equities number two report writing Ugh. Uh, number three the decumulation phase in retirement which which all of these in their own way are massive and we could probably do a whole meat and potatoes on each section, but we're going to address these as we go along. Now, just forgive me, Amina, because I'm going to read out what you put in. You, and these are your words, not mine. You, your, your email vomit, your word vomit. You just typed away um, and sent yeah, an email. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so global equities, index tracking, got it. Simple wealth, inevitable wealth, the, the Nick Murray book that's, that's client-facing, refers to five core types of equities to be included. Yeah, value, growth, large cap, small cap, alternatives, blah, blah, blah. Um, when you refer to this as being the wealth creator for clients, and 100% equity invested with, with a small bit in cash for reserve funds. Um, how, how, it's an easy statement to agree with, but how do you go about doing that? How do you find those funds or fund? I'm left in the dark. I'm being you, Amelia. I'm left in the dark. What basis are you selecting funds? What platforms do you use? What are your criteria for selecting? And what do you do with CGT, ISA allowances, rebalancing, and so forth? My God, there's just a myriad of questions off there. Just coming back to the main theme of this first point in the meat and potatoes, the... the um, the global equity, you know, how do you find the funds or fund? We've all been on journeys. We've all, you know, I've been an IFA since 2001. Alan's been an IFA uh, similar time period, 2004. Yeah. And Andy was once a polyester suited mortgage advisor, reeking of, of, of <laughs> desperation. But he's, he's, have you got your advice? Have you been signed off now, Andy? Yeah, I've got my, uh, oh, yeah, cast, still training. Cast, competent advisor status, cast. 
Very good, very good. Yeah, so, he's uh, got oh, he's got overconfident advisor status. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not good on there. Um, <laughs> and, and we've all in our in our journeys, we've all sort of made this this this. this we've all been down. It's, it's remarkably similar, actually, kind of progression where you, you start off with thinking that you're going to be a fund picker and that yes you want to have a you want to have a portfolio of funds where you have your global small cap and maybe your your your, your you know your value funds over there and you have some emerging markets they used to be the things called brick funds brazil russia india china which were the kind of really cool emerging market funds about 15 years ago and you'd have portfolios and then then after a while when you realize that financial planning is front and center and actually, the, the financial plan determines the level of growth that clients need to get on their saved pots, on their capital. You start to think, well, actually, as long as the clients pick up the broad market returns, this, this whole pursuit of alpha and outperformance is, is utterly irrelevant. Um, and then you tag onto that the behavioral side that, okay, once you, once, once you accept or once the clients accept, they need to pick up the broad market returns and we're not going for outperformance. Our role as financial planners is to make sure clients are always invested to pick up those returns because market timing, dipping in and out is a surefire way to poverty. You kind of just, you refine it, refine it. And I, yes, Amelia, I really have, I'm a simple soul and I really have simplified my, my, my investment uh, proposition now to use a horribly overused cliche. I, you know, with, uh, and this is not advice to anyone listening who's not in this thing of ours. And I know members of the public do listen to this. I basically now, for most of my clients, have a one fund solution. Uh, a, a, I won't name the fund, but I mean, it's one fund that gives massive global exposure, has lo- um, value exposure, has a small cap exposure, has emerging markets, has about 13,000 of the great companies of the world in it. And that's what I use. And it's to, uh, it's passive, I guess. There's no star fund manager running it. They just buy world markets. They buy world capitalism. They buy everything that we spend our money on every day. It's like the shopping list fund. Okay, so I say to clients, if you go into this fund, everything you spend your money on, you now own a fraction of that brand in this fund. And every time you spend money there, you're driving up their profits and dividends. You're just buying the world market. Don't sweat it. But it took me an awful long time to get there. And I think you've got to be relatively self-confident to go to clients and say, yeah, this is our investment proposition. It's not particularly important, actually. The plan's important. But if you're interested, this is the fund. Go have a look at it if you want to. That's what I've I think that's how I shortened that whole big word vomit is I get the theory and I agree with it. I agree that that's where value is. That's where growth is. That's how you keep Hmm. in pace with inflation. But implement it, especially somebody that's going through you know i'm i'm doing report writing i'm trying to figure out the platforms that i like i'm trying to figure out my way of doing it that is a big statement and that then comes with lots of unpacking like i said about if i'm taking this into managing it myself and not using a discretionary fund manager which we may or may not do with other clients i then take on a lot more responsibility And that's how I need to almost learn how that is done. I don't know whether the platforms do or your CGT and use those allowances or your ISA allowances. How do you navigate that? Because to me, that just looks like an admin headache. That's a, that's a, that's a, it's kind of a different, but so the first point is how do you pick the, you know, how, are you, are you asking how do I justify, if I go to, if I go down this one fund route, say, I'm not suggesting you will, but if you did, how are you asking, how would I justify that? No, so once you, so as as your confidence grows and I understand equity, okay, so I I figure out a way and I find my fund, but then I'm taking this on. So every year I need to make sure that I'm using my allowances, I'm using my CGT, I'm using my, do you actually manually do this or do the platforms do this for you? I I might seem really naive here, but this is just not something I've experienced because we've not had products where we've needed to do that because they've been pensions or... So forth. I mean, I, I, I would when you're when you're doing your annual platform due, due diligence, or however, however often you feel you should do it, but annual is more than enough. You want to make sure they've got a competent capital gains tax calculator, a, a, a working capital gains tax calculator. That's always been a key driver. It's now even more important, obviously, because the CGT allowances are basically m- miserable going forward. Again. Not advice to anyone that's listening, but uh, you know, Transact have a really. I think it's really good. They they Transact will tell you what the pregnant CGT liabilities are, and then once you've sold out, 
of the various funds, they will give you the CGT calculation and it's all online. But some platforms, I mean, I'm not going to denigrate because they might have been better, but I know ones, you know, platforms that use the FNZ underlying software, which is a good deal of them. They're, they're, I've had some ropey CGT experiences. So, so absolutely, I, I, I use a platform where the, I'm confident the CGT counts are pretty accurate. Amelia, and that's 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 a big driver for me, and and just tying that into the one fund simple philosophy, you know, one fund to to to, to fuel all the pots. Um, if you've got one fund, it makes the CGT calculation a little bit easier because you're not working it out over five, six different funds. Um, but yeah, absolutely, make sure the platform that you use that you're you're comfortable with has a functional CGT. Andy, do you have a thought on that? Yeah, I think it's the exception, not the rule, <clears throat> that platforms have a decent CGT calculator. Um, as advisors, yeah, we can get ourselves in a bit of knots actually looking at CGT. I know I've, I've had a couple of phone calls with you, Nick, recently about some of the changes that are coming in and how does it play out and stuff. Um, yeah, Transact have, has a great CGT calculator and you can input all of the uh, uh, purchase values when you transfer assets across. So you need to get that from the provider that you're leaving from. Um yeah. Uh, the other question you mentioned, I mean, I, I, similar to Nick, have been on a journey with investment management. I mean, luckily, I only spent a year of my career picking funds. And then some bright spark said to me, why don't you go and see David Jones um, from Dimension or we'll be able to help you out. And then I ended up in my uh, polyester suit in Down Street in Mayfair, sitting there being educated <laughs> about investments with David Jones. And he was telling me some crazy things like, uh, let's say you're at a village fate and you've got to guess the weight of the ball. Uh, did you know that the average would be closer than all the individual guests? You know, just sort of crazy thought experiments I was just sort of nodding along to. Uh, anyway, I went on the courses. I think it was a two-day course that they ran. So I'm, I predominantly use Vanguard and Dimensional. Now, I mean, I'm not averse to using um, providers like BlackRock, like LNG um, on their sort of uh, HSBC on their sort of index funds, but I find that Vanguard and Dimensional uh, do all I need as such. Massive fan of Vanguard, massive fan of Dimensional. You know, just thought sort of the ethos and the sort of principles of the companies. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that's given you a bit, a bit of an insight, but yeah, over to you, Alan. Yeah, you um, you mentioned uh, outsourcing to discretionary fund managers, uh, as the, and that's I guess all of us have maybe. Well, I've certainly we've done that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that drop works. That's, that's a new one. That's that lasted a bit too long. Uh, what you find is over the years, that's a, that's a nice, that's kind of an elegant solution for the advisor because that's what we used to think. You know, we'll do all the planning and advice and everything else, but we're no experts at the investment management piece. All these sort of sharp suited, um, you know, people with double barrel names, they will be great at it. The, the reality is they're not, and so we explore, but on an evidence based basis analyzing what the actual returns were once you layer in all the different sort of costs and charges it doesn't make sense so therefore you've got to work out and i agree with you emily amelia you've got to have an a kind of an elegant workable solution because if you begin to bring this in-house and suddenly you're just running yourself around in circles trying to do sort of portfolio management on a client by client basis that's not going to be workable either so you need a structure and a strategy andy mentioned it already i've mentioned it on this podcast before Contact, I think the best kept secret in investment management, contact Dimensional Fund Advisors and ask to go along on their two-day Foundations of Investment Conference. You're going to just, it will blow your mind. You will learn so much and they will guide you and help you. Now, beyond that, there's a number of different solutions. You can do that in-house. You can build this in-house. You would get confidence, of, com, more and more confident as you understood it. There are also a number of, there are a few, not many, high-quality outsourced discretionary services uh, timeline being one of them. Timeline offer broadly similar investment propositions <clears throat> to ours. They use Dimensional, they use Vanguard. They've got, you know, if if it appeals to you, they've got ESG versions of the portfolios. Don't see anything, Nick. Um, and it's all super low cost because they've negotiated uh, institutional terms. So that might be a sort of at least a stepping stone. You know, speak to someone, and you know, other discretionary managers do uh, do exist, but they're worthwhile exploring. Um, but it's, it's a journey you go on. And I think all of us, you end up with a simple, effective, low cost, 
sensible solution, but you've got to be confident you can manage it in house. So look, if if us lot can do it, then you certainly can. I'm I'm and so it. pleased. I'm so pleased that a year into my career, I turned the entire active management industry noise off. And then I could focus yep. on obviously exams, financial planning, yeah. building a business, marketing, you know, client focus stuff. I mean, Jesus Christ, I dread to think how much time is wasted. And it adds zero value. But I, I used to it show up. Go, yeah, you, you go you go to a go to a you know presentation that's you know XYZ fund manager with their views on you know the global equity markets and whether the the, the direction of the dollar sterling is just utter utter nonsense. And yeah, my God, it's just such a waste of everyone's time. So if you meet, as, as you say, I love getting, I get these emails and you can just come, you know, quickly press delete. Don't need to think about it anymore because, you know, we've, we've, we've found the secret sauce as much what? as it can exist. There's the worst, no, no, nothing's perfect, but it's, this is the least bad option. The worst thing about those conferences is at the end of the talk, three or four people would ask a, like a genuine question. It's like <laughs> yeah. the, the, the person's just lied yeah. from the stage and now you're asking them a serious question. I mean, are you, are you insane? Like, just get out. Anyway, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I subscribe immediately to some to some newsletters from from wealth management firms just for the giggles, really, because yeah. they come through <laughs> once a week, and they go on and on and on about this stuff. And I'm thinking some poor sap has actually sat down and yeah. gone yeah. to uh, FE Analytics and printed off all these graphs and really thinks that they know about the China macro widget sector rotation into value. <laughs> and what it's happened like, that they're, week? They're, they're I mean, deranged. It's uh, it's back to it's, nuts. it's amazing what someone will think when their salary depends on it. I but mean, I, I, they, and, they yeah, genuinely and yet, believe it. And yet, but the vast the vast majority, from what I've seen of of money, is managed on that basis with those people yeah. who think they've got a view. We as we said at last episode of the one before, there's still you know at best twenty percent of investments is managed on the sort of embracing the philosophy that we all embrace. So. Um, it is a differentiator. And I think also, if you're not quite there yet on that strategy, Amelia, it's a very powerful message to your clients. It, first of all, it would theoretically significantly reduce their costs. And it's a much more thoughtful, you know, the, they use the phrase evidence-based, but it's a, it's the sort of thing that the smart people are doing. You know, the, I can tell you there's no professor of economics, people who already understand this, who, who outsources their own personal wealth to discretionary managers to ask them to sort of play the markets. Those with kind of academic rigor in their careers and their history and their, their research, they embrace this stuff. So it's almost like you're inviting your clients into a, a secret society of smart investing. And I think it's a very well, compelling it, message. I think it was Jeremy Siegel who said that acti- um, journalists write about active funds all day and then by night stick their money in passive funds. Yeah. <laughs> you know exactly. in, in fact, just l- l- linking us all, talking about my, my read- reading at the weekend, the guy, what's his name? Stuart, the ex- What's the, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know the guy, but he's, he's the uh, HSBC, HSBC guy. guy. HSBC guy. He writes a monthly column in the FT, Kirk. and he wrote it this, this Stuart Kirk, yeah, he wrote it this weekend. And he, the headline is, and this is an, a guy who spent his entire career in active management. Headline is, active management doesn't work. So that should be good enough for the rest of us. Okay. Um, I mean, a closed question, Amelia, in the interest of time. Have you investigated Dimensional at all? I am speaking to Elliot, yeah. I was meant to go on their two-day course in June, but um, I had a few things crop up, so I couldn't get down to London. So I think I'm going to go on one in a few weeks' time or a few months' time. You were, you were busy okay. building your house, okay. were you? I'm just a busy bee, busy bee with lots of things. <laughs> I've booked to come see you, Andy, so you better not disappoint. To what? Cost me an oh. arm and a leg. That free ticket went within seconds, yeah? All right, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. No problem. There you go. There you go. You've got you've got someone coming to your to your. Okay. Just quick. I've I've actually sold out of harm. I've got ten reassuringly expensive tickets left. If people really want to go and you know are hit by FOMO, so yeah, I've sold out harm London. So all good. Sorry. Back to you, Nick. Well good done. Man. No, no, well it's done. Good. Yes, good. that's brilliant. Brilliant. Um, just a, you mentioned rebalancing. I mean, again, don't sweat it, Amelia. I mean, I rebalance once a year. There's the evidence saying that once a year is probably okay. Some <laughs> platforms now will do automatic rebalancing for you. So Fundment will do it on a tolerance basis. You know, if it, if it drifts off by whatever parameter you set, I think 10% is the deep. Don't sweat it. Uh, it's... Most of what we do, and I'm learning this as well, when we start up, we think that everything is science. I've got all the exams. This is all hard stuff. This is Most of what we do actually is art. 
you have to know the science, you have to know the rules, you have to know the tax regulations and everything else, but the, most of it is art and you cannot quantify what we do, which is why the regulator will never quite get what we do because the regulator wants to prescribe everything. Well, you can't do it. We're dealing with human beings and a lot of it is vague and, and clients, you know, the question to most, the question we should be asking clients is what's your tolerance for ambiguity? Yeah. Okay, you're coming with us, I mean, you know, with, with, with sports people, you're coming us on potentially a six decade, seven decade journey. We don't know how anything's going to pan out over, over that time. We can just make a best guest informed plan for you and then tweak the plan as we go along. But if you want certainty, you know, die now. That's the only thing, <laughs> you know, so that's that's the rebalancing. That's what I would say on rebalancing. Sorry, I, I'm kind of going through because we're well, 54 minutes into this. The shambolic 21st episode. <laughs> report writing. This, back, so, Amelia, I'm talking in your voice here, so do forgive me. Report writing in capital letters. This is my bugbear. Yeah, well, you know, hallelujah, join the club. Um, and it's currently oh, t- very time consuming. Um, yeah, videos and other systems to communicate with clients. But do you avoid written reports entirely? Okay, well, let's just stop there. No, you can't avoid written reports, certainly, you know, and I, I, we all have to give advice. We all have to give it in a permanent format. And I certainly give my advice in PDF form to clients, but I am using Loom more and more. Um, I know Alan is big on Loom, both for external That's the videos. Yes, yeah, the yeah. videos, yeah. Video just a, one, yeah. Yeah, it's just a nice way of, you know, rather than typing out a lengthy, you know, people. the last thing people want in their lives is another bloody Slack message or email or what have you. But if you can, if you can send a... Very, but, but they want a video of your face, Nick, in the room. Well, box. not really. I do. I do, I do, I do uh, thank you for that. I do, I do make it as small as I possibly can on the video. I, I minimise it down and say, get my shining chrome down out of it. But it just, you know, you can talk for 60 seconds and have a backdrop of whatever, the, maybe the cash flow, and just to yep. recap to people, rather than typing out a warm PC, you just be creative with it. But you absolutely have to give written advice and you have to do it. Do you have fact find documents? Okay, I'll go here and then someone can jump in because I'm talking quite a bit. Your compliance people will say, oh, yeah, have a, you do the fact find. And when you've got that nailed down, then you give the advice. Well, that's rubbish. The fact find is an organic document. It's always being updated, but certainly through the onboarding process. Clients will say, oh, yeah, I've got this pot over here. I've got this personal, I've got this personal pension with Mercer's, and it's worth 350 grand. And you, and you scrabble it down, okay, on the fact find. Fact, and then it turns out two months later, what they have is a transfer value from Mercer's worth 350 grand that they got a few years ago, but they don't know. So you're always adapting the fact find. Um, but yeah, I have a Word document, simple three-page Word document, and I just type into it as and when the facts change. Um, when I give advice, I'll then print off a PDF of that fact find so it's locked at that moment in time. And that goes in the compliance folder along with that bit of advice. But the, the, the fact finds organic. It's always evolving. Clients are always finding things they forgot about or they've always, they don't know what, you know, we use all this jargon. They don't, you ask them a question, how many, how many money purchase pension schemes have you got? They're going, what? You know, they're so it's, it's, it's got to be, it's got to be adaptive. Um, the FCA doesn't tell you what a good report is. No, it doesn't. Um, soft facts. I, I had a FCA audit a few years ago, as did Mr. Hart. Um, and one of the things that got me through it amazingly without any issues at all was the fact that my suitability reports, I, I, I go heavy on the soft stuff, the background to the inquiry, what are your key concerns and so forth. And I, and I don't dwell on the hard facts in the advice report. Um, I'm doing a lot of talking here. My uh, final thing, my advice reports are about three pages, four pages long, and then a whole <laughs> host of appendices at the back. You know, so this is what an ISA is. This is what a pension is. Even though you can Google this shit, I've got to put it in here. But let's stick it at the back so you don't Ooh, get bored of my, you know, swearing, end, end, swearing. end things. Um, swearing. Well, you did two F bombs last last time, Mister Mister Hart. So um, yeah, guys, help me out here. What do you What do you do on the um, report? Writing? Oh, I'll, I'll chip in here. Yeah. So I started to do Loom videos for my power planner, which is working really well. I've got an outsourced power planner. They are amazing. Um, I don't share who they are because they'll get too busy and then <laughs> just offer really bad service to me. That's generally what happens with outsourced people. Um, so they are um, fantastic. Yeah, Loom videos, are, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. Um, yeah, we have to write written reports. Uh, obviously, it's a regulatory requirement. Fact finding, yeah, I use the original Voyant fact find, and then I uh, upload all the information into Voyant. That's updated all the time. 
I export the advisor fact find. They've got a new document, actually. Uh, have you seen it, Nick? It's called Plan Assumptions. It's a pretty decent um, export report. Um, it's mainly for us, us firms rather than clients. It's quite detailed. Like, a client would be a bit confused with it. Um, yes, yeah, so it's constantly being updated. Um, the annual suitability is sort of factored into that. Uh, and it's all around, yeah, full full financial planning. Um, yeah, um, I hopefully things like AI are going to help us out with these report writing. But we're still, you know, beholden to these legacy companies that just take ages to do things. I mean, I'm switching one fund from one provider and they want a 13-page printed form with wet signatures. And, it, and it's the Neil Woodford fund that was left on the platform because I didn't want to move it, but now we have to move it. And it's, it's going to, I don't I'm gonna dread to think how many hours is spent with within my firm to deal with this one fund being transferred from an old provider to 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 transact the old provider wants a 13 page physical form in the post wet signature it's insane anyway alan not much more to add really the uh i i believe in the as steve jobs once said begin with the customer then work your way back so there are some things that we have to legally do but how does it sort of land in your clients sort of um, in their view? Because these long and they are, you know, 10, 12 pages long suitability reports, in my experience, very few people actually read them, read them thoroughly. But we, it, no it's, one it's reads a, them. It's no, well, we've had a couple of clients that read them. <laughs> page, page 17, Alan. This, yeah. uh, I, I haven't read yeah. it. So, um, what do you mean, what, what do you mean by yeah, engineers and lawyers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's why the video things can be useful. You just simply look, and we, we would generally try to post, we use, a, we use a portal. So we write the suitability report, we post it on their portal. Quick video, look, it's up there, it's in the portal, you get access to it. But what it says is this, 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 and this, in a, in a verbal, and people will certainly watch a, a two, three minute video far sooner than they will read a long verbose document. But, and we, you know, n you know naming, software we use a system currently called genovo which is okay is designed for writing suitability reports i don't want to sort of put them down too much i think they're the best of a bad bunch really i don't think any of these systems are good and yes you know all roads currently um, lead back to ai being able to build these things on a highly personalized basis once we put the actual the stuff that we have to disclose put that in and then personalize them using sort of modern technology but it's a real pain do you know what i think when i'm reading reading your notes here emilia just interesting we th us old lags on this this group and, and our learned friend from ireland as well <laughs> we've all got this the curse of knowledge really because i'm looking at this and think well just because over the years i kind of just you build up experience build up knowledge as nick has alluded to earlier there's some things which are important you must spend some time on and others which is uh, it's just a kind of a, a you know rule of thumb or just you know just be sensible i'm looking at your specific questions and i'm just thinking where do people like young planners coming through where do you learn from where do you really get into the weeds of these things and have conversations like this we will simply not be able to do this justice in the time we've got here because each one of those could be an hour if you like so i think there seems to be a, a, a need for more more practitioner-led uh information training advice something like that maybe we should do a live in-person full day trap event one day Get every, called, get every, called, to, uh, to share our knowledge and wisdom called in the weeds yeah <laughs> deep in the weeds i think yeah. that's the, i think that is the point though isn't it that i'm coming in trying to find my feet yeah. looking and taking lots of knowledge from you and then you guys throw out more books to read so i read the books and yeah. they've got concept in the books and i'm like well, what's left and what's right anymore i, I kind of i don't know and I, i'm trying to make sense of it all um but the knowledge you have is invaluable yeah. and you will probably exit the profession in what another three or four months you'll retire and <laughs> grow old yeah and, and it'll all Can't be lost wait. Yeah. all of that wisdom will be lost and the well, likes of me have to figure it out again so yeah there's definitely no, no it's transfer a, there it's a, it's a good point there needs to be oh. something because i mean I, I grew up, I think Nick and I certainly worked for big corporations. We did get some decent training in-house back in the day. That's far less prevalent. Most financial planning companies, most of them, with a couple of exceptions, are small businesses. And no one's really got the time or attention to, do, like, to build a training program or to teach all this stuff in, in, in great detail. And yes, you learn on the job, but it's a far, it's a far longer journey to le learn on the job when you could have a, you know, an ability for knowledge transfer earlier on. It's a good point. We need to explore how we can help that. 
Just on that point, I would say I obviously work with my mum, who is an incredible mm. mentor, 30 odd years in the profession. Yeah. Um, love working alongside her, but she is my only person to bounce off. She's uh, And everything that she's done isn't necessarily correct. Likewise yeah. with you guys, not everything you do, I will necessarily think is the well, right way to do it. Well. But the point being is... You <laughs> you bounce the ideas. I mean, that's the point of the podcast, right? You yeah. bounce around the ideas. Yeah. You can yeah. take them apart if you feel, but largely there's a better way to approach things. I was reading um, The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet yeah. Holmes. Good book. He was, yeah, yeah, he was really emphasizing training. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, and he was just saying about training, you know, it's overlooked. This needs to be yeah. done routinely, regularly. Um, everybody needs to be efficient. Otherwise, you will never be the ultimate sales machine. So. Well, relate, relating relating it back to your sports thing, there's not, there's not a sports team that doesn't train relentlessly. Elite sports Andy, teams are always training. I think the journey you're going on, Amelia, is very typical of anyone who's seeking excellence. Uh, you know, you, you clearly want to, you know, do, you know, become a great financial advisor. Um, and it's no different to a... What, and what the journey everyone goes on and the, the challenge is at the moment you need to learn as much as you can the real skill is unlearning you probably heard me talk about this before mm. so you want to take in as much as you can and then over time you just you just trim and and then you you you, you shrink your circle of competence like at the moment i'm you know uh, i don't uh, i've just got the answer immediately when i sit down with clients that doesn't mean we don't go on a bit of a bit of a journey bit of a dance <laughs> Andy, the ultra grubber Darren Andy, he knows about everything, Andy, can't be told anything, his name is Andrew Hart, Andrew Hart! What a voice. Okay, so just on that, yeah, um, what you're doing I think is great, <laughs> um, learn as much as you can, and then the, the trick is to unlearn, but there is no shortcut. You know, to, to, to achieve something great, there is no shortcut. So you have Agreed. to go on a bit of a long, windy journey. 10,000 yeah, 10, hours, right? I mean, I mean, you can shortcut the journey like you're doing, consuming a lot of stuff. And having your mum as a mentor, friend, colleague is absolutely invaluable. I know you're sort of seeking more as such, but wow. Like, you know, your mum, 30 years in the profession, and, you know, I, I don't yeah. know her, but I'm assuming... She's decent. I mean, the key to being successful in this business is being in this business. The longer you stay in this business, the more successful you be. And she's been in it for 30 years. So, wow. Um, so, yeah. Okay, Trap Pack. I'm, listen, we're, we're, time is bloody racing by. We're having a good thing. Third point of the meat and potatoes, I mean, that you wrote is the decumulation stage. I'm sorry, just quickly closing on the report writing. It is your bugbear. And as you, because you're forming a business and storming, you're going to be taking on lots of clients and be giving lots of advice at the start, which will mean lots of report writing. And there's no way around it. That will taper off as your business matures and you focus more on looking after the clients you've already got than onboarding the new clients, which is a pain for everybody. And it's just the price of admission. At the moment, decumulating clients. Matthew Jarvis delivering tremendous value. <laughs> Guardrails. How do you approach clients who are decumulating and equity invested? How do you approach clients who, even when you have broken down what volatility is and the risk to capital is the value being eroded, not the volatility of the markets, those people who still want a lower risk exposure, I don't take them on board, Amelia. Uh, the, the key message is about the risk to your purchasing power being eroded by inflation and everything else is noise. Volatility is your friend. And if they don't get it or they push back at the prospecting stage, they don't get on the arc. The easiest way to keep the loons out of your life is not to let them into your life in the first place and just have a ruthless onboarding mechanism. Um, Amelia, what do you think about that? So I, I kind of see that in two parts. One is decumulating clients. And when we've had a period of volatility and declines in the market for the last two years, where everything's just been a little bit messy, mm. how do you approach decumulation there when it is potentially the only source of income for a client? How are you safeguarding the returns that you aren't eating into the capital too much to continue their income? Can I, I'll just throw in my, my two penneth. This this is the essence of real financial planning. It's 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 matching. It's sort of it's it's liability matching. If you know the client needs to have fifty thousand pounds a year to support their lifestyle with a specific time horizon, and you've adjusted for inflation, and, and you've you built a really you know, granular, high quality financial model, financial plan, 
then in our opinion, you, you're keeping your assets you know you're going to be spending over the next two or three years in non-volatile assets, which is predominantly cash. And yes, you're taking a hit. That is going to be suffering at the hands of inflation, but you know you're going to be spending it pretty soon. You don't have the, the luxury of taking or of embracing short-term market volatility because you don't want to, because you, know, you know the client's going to be spending it. So identifying capital expenditure, like I want to buy a new car next year, I want to go on a massive holiday and I want to... You know, I just want to enjoy the, you know, the, 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 the fruits of my labor and enjoy sort of a nice lifestyle. Um, that, that is the essence. And, it, and back to Nick's point, it, it, we, we do apply science, but then there's, there's a kind of rule of thumb and a conversation and a, a managing it across the client's lifestyle. There is no perfect solution, but with the benefit Can of- Can I your, ask you uh, off the back of that? Yeah. When you've done decumulating then, and obviously you use Voyan or you use a financial planning cash flow model, I've not had the experience where I've gone, do you know what, Voyant was there or thereabouts. It was, I was about right. The markets did do this and the pot was about this in five years time. Have you found that your financial planning on cash flow has matched largely how you thought it was going to go? Andy, I'll chip in for that. Yes. <laughs> um, it's scary how accurate I am. If I went back 10 years ago uh, in 2013, <laughs> Oh, honestly, me, 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 again. Nick, me and Nick talk about it a bit, don't we, Nick? Yeah, we, me and Nick, me and Nick. So if I went yeah. back to, to 2013 uh, and, and where I told a client they would be in 2023, weirdly, I'm not that far off. It's scarily accurate. Sometimes I have to triple check it and go, are the liquid assets that close to what I projected? Um, yeah, so I use simplistically cautious, deterministic growth rates and buoyant. And as a real financial advisor, building real plans for real clients, and monitoring those real outcomes, it's scarily, um, scarily accurate. Have you found that, Nick? Yeah, I have. I have. Um, it, it, it just te- things just tend to. It's, it's a funny thing, and I'm not religious or anything, but I think the universe responds. If you plan, if you put a plan in place, and you do those things in that plan that you should be doing, saving and behaving properly, and not disinvesting. Do you know what the plan tends to pan out over time? It just, it just it kind does. of happens, Amelia. Well, I, don't, don't don't forget that you should be doing this and reviewing it once every twelve months at least, anyway. So you're always you're always course correcting. Your plan yeah, will be do. inaccurate yeah, for a period of, course, of time. Of course, so your course your course correcting and can i just throw one other thing in here which i just thought of and we do come come back to our you know our sort of financial planning coaching god in the form of nick murray nick murray is very 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 strong on a concept he calls uh, doing lifeboat drills you're telling your clients if you tell nick murray oh i've had this client he got upset by the volatility and so he's fired me or something nick murray will shout at you you stupid person won't he and he's <laughs> he's you done that on his, in his newsletter you stupid boy um, the so you run a lifeboat. You like you run a lifeboat drill. You you we're not we're saying to your client the, the client when this is not a maybe. This is a definite. There will be periods in our relationship with the capital value in the, of the short term of your retirement fund will be lower than the last time we met. It is a guarantee. So we're going to act out what we'll do. Let's just kind of role play it. It's a lifeboat drill. When you, you've got a, a you know a, an ocean going liner, they do lifeboat drills. What would happen? They're, not, they're hoping the ship doesn't sink, but if it ever does, someone we've re- we've rehearsed it. And you, it's all you create your kind of the financial plan added to a lifeboat drill. That is your North Star. And in those moments, because clients are uniquely human, as we are, and everyone gets a bit worried and everyone gets a bit scared because they've been absolutely bombarded by the, the, you know, the negative events, world service, the news, throwing negative stuff. We say, remember, we built the North Star. We did the lifeboat drill. What does the plan say? What does the plan tell us we will do in the inevitable experience that the markets are done? We will do nothing. We'll adjust. We'll rebalance. We'll look to our cash assets and we'll carry on. Remember that? Yes. Good. And that's, so you've got to plan Andy, ahead for it. I think it's important to revisit that or bang on about that a lot in the welcome meeting. So I'm all about generally the market goes up about 75% of the time, down about 25% of the time. These are good odds. At least once a year, the market will decline from a high point to a low point of minus 14%. Um, you know, just banging on about these things. So they're going into it with their eyes wide open. Um, it, there's nothing worse than the client throwing in a, a grenade every so often as in an email. It takes them three seconds to write between the car and the train station. It takes you three hours to freaking deal with. So the less grenades you can get from <laughs> yeah, your no, clients, well the better. Yeah, no, 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 no. yeah I, I mean, just, just, just the low friction. A client could send you a WhatsApp. Uh, what's happening to my portfolio? And you think, oh, is this is this uh, something important to deal with? You know, it's just such low friction. So anything important needs to be a face to face meeting. But yeah, um, in the welcome meeting, I really do bang on about the high level information around the markets. 
Um, uh, interestingly, Amelia, you've been predominantly, I think, only in the profession for a couple of years. So you've had sidewards mark, you know, declining sidewards markets for two years, mm. which is good. You know, you earn your golden yeah. coins during the declines and, and the down times. You know, during the good times, I mean, any old schmuck can uh, can can sound. Uh, you know, pretty intelligent in front of clients as we've all experienced during true. the good times. This is true. Yeah, even even Nicholas Lincoln. I think I think that just 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 close <laughs> exactly. Just closing on. Thank you for that. Just closing on this. The de- yeah the, de- the decumulation. The, I don't call it the decumulation. I call it the spending phase. Decumulation is one of those horrible words that nobody outside of what we do understands. It's the spending stage, yeah. and this is not new. This is not have a couple of years worth of living expenses in cash. Within your, if it's within your pension fund, say if it's outside of the pension fund, have to have put the max you can into premium bonds. Husband and wife, hundred grand. If the markets are going down, we stop the withdrawals from investment portfolio and we we lean on that. Most bear markets are over within about thirty six to forty months. Okay, peak to trough. As soon as it goes back up again, we start. Spe- but again, it's just the art part of it, you know. And, having and you then replenish that. You on the years of good you take from. Well, the that's just to repl- the, the fact is the markets recover. The, if, the, if the markets decline, they tend to recover as aggressively and more. And actually, you yeah. never need to replenish that pot because the markets go up most of the time anyway, and they go up and up and up until you have a long time until the next dip. And actually, the portfolio has recovered so much. But if you wanted to, if it made you feel better, yeah, you could strip some of that later growth out, put it back into premium bonds. But the chances are the portfolio is recovered to such a degree, you don't need to have that two years living expense bucket, really. That uh, you know, it just it shouldn't be needed. But you can do that. If it, and more importantly, if it makes the clients feel comfortable and it will keep them mainly invested by having mm-hmm. that little safety blanket there, then then do it. You know, because the idea, you know, we're all very dogmatic and driven and we have our beliefs, but ultimately you want the clients to be comfortable and to remain invested. So if having a little pot there, safety pot there, Keeps them on track. Crack up, crack on, and do it. Listen, gents, we're at gents and and lady guests. We're at <laughs> one hour fifteen minutes. I think we're going to skip the because uh, the, there must be something wrong with the traffic around Watford. The post is not turned up with her <laughs> with her bulging sack. Um, so I think we should go straight to Culture Corner. Are we okay with that? Let's do it. Sure. Okay, let's go through this, Mister Smith, the uh, Scott Galloway podcast with Ryan. Holiday. <laughs> God, another, close, another personal close personal friend of mine. Personal friend of yours, isn't oh, it? Professor's, professor's professor. Three thousand seven hundred and eighty-nine. <laughs> No, I met him. I saw him. I, uh, if anyone knows, Professor Scott been, Gallery, Prof G. I'm a big, I've, I've mentioned before, but I've been yeah, lurking around the streets of the West End of London Marleybone, where he's, yeah. he's relocated to Marleybone. And I saw him as at lunch with Ruth, uh, another advisor. Uh, a few weeks ago and Scott Galloway went in and I yeah I went up and accosted him and said can I have a selfie please and uh, he told me where to go but he was uh, no he's, he was a gentleman I, 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 anyway I, I am th- a big big fan I go think on. that week Alan I think that week in his blog he was talking about fame and being approached by randoms in yeah. the street literally the week random was, weirdos yeah yeah, exactly right. Yeah. In his newsletter, his weekly newsletter, just come out. He said, uh, "Yeah, people come up About and approach fame. me in the street." Yeah. But he said they're always very, very positive and kind and all that. So no, he was he was he was good before he told me where to go. He's got a <laughs> he's got a podcast which I listen to every week, and it's like a lot of podcasts. As some episodes are better than others. The one out this week or last week, he interviews Ryan Holiday. I don't know if any of you come across Ryan Holiday. Andy probably would have done. Ryan Holiday is a sort of, he studies the Stoics. Yeah. If you know the Stoics, the kind of ancient wisdom, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, Epictetus, and others. And there are so many lessons from the, this ancient wisdom that apply to us today. Ryan Holiday has got a new book out, and it's sort of, and, and this might uh, appeal to you as well, Emilia. All of us on this call are parents, and he's got um, Stoicism for parents you know some of the things as you got if you've got young little kids which sort of you know drive you nuts sometimes but there's an approach you take so it's a really nice interview that um, scott galloway does with ryan holiday and he talk about yes yeah, stoicism as it, in, in the modern world and how it particularly relates to parenting well worth checking out thank you i'm uh, I'm, 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 I'm six days into potty training twins will the book be able to assist with that alan <laughs> <laughs> yeah it will. You should. You should get the book. Listen they've to mastered, it. They've training. mastered the number ones and not mastered the number twos. I wish it was the other way around. Hey ho! Fantastic, fantastic. Thanks for sharing. TMI. That. TMI. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my oh, culture corner is this. This book must be well known actually because I think it, that Dan Solin is well known, and I must have learned it from someone here or someone maybe at the a peer group. 
yeah. down the line. But ask how to relate to anyone by Dan Solin, which I'm I'm uh, reading the uh, the. Uh, the Kindle version, I think. Uh, really good, really good. I know that Alan and I are big fans of um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale yeah. Carnegie, which is the preeminent self-help, self-improvement book, and everything stems from that. Ask How to Relate to Anyone by Dan Solon. It's like an updated version of that book, really. And it's just a re really, and I would suggest getting copies of that for your staff, for your family, or what have you, because it just, it'll help your human interactions. Um, believe it or not, it's helped mine, um, but I'm a work in progress. Going on to the next culture corner, Mr. Hart, Gawinda Bogle. Yeah, so I've got a couple of uh, culture corners. I can't get enough of this guy. Gawinda Bogle is a modern day sort of philosopher. He was on the Chris Williamson podcast three times. He's on another podcast called The Seen and the Unseen. Two hours and 15 minutes. It's absolutely mind-blowing. Just check him out. I mean, his story is fantastic. It's a superb podcast. Uh, following on for self-help books, there's a book by the School of Life. I'm a huge fan of the School of Life. I believe they're based around Holborn. And they do sort of live um, events, and they also do a lot of materials and books. They've got a great book called Arguments, uh, and it's a really small book. And it, 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 it describes the 20 types of argument. Uh, and when you're reading it, it just, I mean, it's not new stuff that you don't know, but the way it sort of crystallizes all this information in your brain, it's really, really useful. Certainly if you're in a relationship, which everybody on the call is, and people listening to this probably will be, it's very interesting. Yeah, it's just called Arguments, and it's the 20 different types of arguments. It's a really small book. Uh, you go through it in probably one or two sittings. But yeah, I, I check out all the stuff from the School of Life. So check it out, the School of Life. They've got amazing videos on YouTube. And they've got loads of card games and stuff um, that you can buy online that I've bought and sort of done with friends and family and maybe a couple of clients. So, yeah, School of Life is a, is a, is a huge recommendation. Um, back to you, Lick. Thank you very much. If there's one from the trap bag, don't, don't need it. It's a, it's, a, it's a lesson in how to argue. <laughs> we, we, we have it down <laughs> to an art form. But So that, that's great stuff. Um, Amelia, anything to throw in? I just read everything you send me and my <laughs> AF1 textbook. So <laughs> my <laughs> life's really not very exciting. Yeah, nothing too crazy there. But I'm I'm reading The Ultimate Sales Machine. I just finished Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth on Holiday. Um, and um, Delivering Massive Value was the audio book I was listening to. What did you think Andy. of Simple Wealth? What did you think of Simple Wealth, Inevitable Wealth by Nick Murray? Is that your first Nick Murray book? Yeah, first one. What it was really hard it? to get hold of as well, actually. It took ages. Yeah, it, um, it was really good. I like it. Like I was saying, I, the theory around equity investment, and that's where I brought some of the concepts for that question that yeah. he kind of just sees five. And he actually talks about, and I don't know whether I'm being a bit controversial here, Nick, but he talks about over-investing and having too much diversification um, and it made me think about some of the funds that I've looked at where you've got tens of thousands of shares and his comment there. And then I was like, mm. can I, can I interject? I think my record, no, I know he, he's talking about where you where advisors were to have like six or seven or eight funds thinking they're diversified. Yeah. And what you've actually got is massive overlap within those funds. Okay. So you haven't, you haven't got diversification in the sense you've got thousands and thousands of great companies. You've got funds that are investing in the same great companies and actually aren't that diversified. So they're kind of redundant. We um, see that, you see that all the time. You take on new clients and they've been with some previous advisors. They've got 27 different or 35 different funds but if you just lift the lid, they're all investing in broadly the same things. So but the, the thing they're diversifying at a fund level, when actually they're not, that's what Nick Murray's kind of you know, uh, um, pointing out. Whereas something that Nick's got, you've got like 10,000 underlying securities, which is you know, with one fund. So that's arguably far, far better. But yeah, there's, the more you dig into this, the more, <laughs> the more questions probably arise. So perhaps we'll have to have you back again, Amelia, in a future episode when one of us takes off for holidays. <laughs> I'll just keep reading everything you send, and oh, then I'll brilliant. come and interrogate you about it. All right. Well, I think I think listen. I think we're listen. We're eighty eighty three minutes in, and this has been Amelia. Thank you so much. You've been a star. Thank, thank you for so your prep much. work and everything else. You've you've contributed a great deal. Yeah. Um, we're going to see you, Amelia, at Humans Under Management. So if we don't win the Next Gen Best Podcast of the Year <laughs> award, you're going to be in trouble. Um, yeah. I think we can say it's a wrap for this episode. Thank you, dear Trappist, for your precious time and your input into the show. Rate us, leave a review on iTunes. Six out of five stars would be lovely. Watch us, God forbid, on YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Until the next time, 
adios from the trap pack and uh, take care out there folks goodbye goodbye see ya bye And the outro is not playing. There we go. It doesn't always work, does it? But let's just stop the recording. <laughs>